All right, so welcome everybody. I'm Mike Shanahan, the Planetarium Director at Liberty Science Center in Jersey City, New Jersey. And as I was saying before, this is our 16th edition of our online planetarium programming. So normally we give shows in the Jennifer Chausty Planetarium, the largest planetarium in America. It is a converted domed film theater. We converted about two and a half years ago, 90 feet in diameter. And we really hope that once things do reopen, you can come over and visit us in our main theater. We are only about four miles across the Hudson from lower Manhattan. We're right near uh, Manhattan, and we're actually named for the Statue of Liberty in the harbor. So until then, we are using the same exact same software that we use for our planetarium shows at the main dome to bring astronomy to you on your home computers, on your phones and on your tablets. It's called Digitar 6. Evans and Sutherland makes it. And a big shout out to them for making this available to us. Now joining us today also, we have Anthony from our STEM team. You may know Andrew. He's getting a well-deserved vacation this week. So Anthony is in the chat. If you have questions about astronomy and the topics of this show, you can go ahead and put those into the chat. Our show will last about a half hour. We'll try to leave some time at the end also to get some of the questions answered that you're putting into the chat. We are, as I was saying a moment ago, a nonprofit. We're doing our darndest to keep things going and keep astronomy education alive. If you do feel inclined to support us with a don donation, there's a donation button somewhere there in their screen. That's the easiest way to make a contribution to us. And that will help us keep the flame alive of astronomy education as we continue with our once every week astronomy programming, one o'clock on Thursday, all the way through August at least, we'll be here doing topics of interest to the public. All right, well, we need to begin our program with that introduction, where all astronomy has its origins. We're going to go out to the morning sky, as you would actually see it tomorrow morning. So here's the sky. If you're an early riser, you would actually see the sky tomorrow morning, looking towards the south at 4.15 before the first light of dawn. Here is what you would see. And over here, we have a constellation called Sagittarius the Archer. It's a good example of a sign of the zodiac. And Sagittarius, if we do a connect the dot, is a constellation that was named maybe 2,500 years ago. And we can still use it today because the stars are so far away and the stars move so slowly that you can't tell any motion even in, in a thousand years if you don't have a telescope. So this star is not going to go this way tomorrow and that star is not going to go that way. But among the stars, there were a handful of dots of light that did move against the starry background. Not in one night. If you see a thing nowadays moving against the starry background, you're seeing an airplane. But over the course of a couple of weeks, these dots would appear to shift their positions. And our ancestors found that very intriguing. Tomorrow morning, you have uh, Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars in the morning sky. They're there throughout the morning sky here in this early summertime. And in a time lapse, you'd see that they not only move against the starry background, but they also move more quickly if they're nearer the sun. So Mars, for example, moving much more quickly than Saturn, where you can barely see any motion at all. The further you are from the sun, the slower you move. That'll be very important as we discuss the outer planets. And so again, that really impressed the heck out of our ancestors. And the Greeks and Romans named the planets after the most important thing they could think of, the gods and goddesses of their culture. So Jupiter, the king of the gods, Saturn, the god of wisdom, Mars, the god of war. And on the other hand, constellations were named after animals or heroic characters. And in fact, the word planet comes from a Greek word meaning wanderer or wandering star. Motion against the starry background means you belong to what we now know as our solar system, a thing that moves is a planet or a comet or an asteroid, but it definitely belongs to our solar system. The stars are like cars on a really distant freeway. We can barely tell the motion. And planets are like the cars zipping in front of your apartment or your house. They go by pretty quickly and you can tell their motion easily. So that being the case, so we didn't know any, about any planets beyond the big five in ancient times. So there was Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And even though the telescope 
was invented by Galileo Galilei in 1609, and it opened up a magical world of unseen moons and other wonders. It took 170 years from the time a telescope was invented to the time we found the first planet using a telescope. And that discovery was made by William Herschel. He was a German who was working uh, in England. He was gigging, he was a musician, so he literally was gigging. He was a music teacher and orchestra conductor working in Bath, a resort town in England. And so his generation here in the late 18th century was a great generation of amateur astronomers. So he might gig for 12 hours a day, teaching music, conducting his orchestra, composing music, and then he'd go home late and take out his six inch diameter telescope and engage in his passion of astronomy. And using this very telescope, he in 1781 doubled the size of the solar system when he discovered the planet we now know as Uranus. He saw that in the skies from his garden in Bath. And tomorrow morning, this is actually where Uranus is located in the sky here in our southern skies. And actually, one amazing fact about Uranus is you can actually see it with your naked eye. But no one noticed it until 1781, March 13 of that year, when it was discovered by William Herschel with his six inch diameter telescope. So it was the first planet ever discovered. They didn't really have a lot of experience in how one should go about naming planets. And so the immediate thought that Mr. Herschel had was to name this planet after King George III, who was the King of England at the time. And uh, King George, you probably know, we rebelled against him during the American Revolution. He also, of course, is a major figure in the hit musical Hamilton, now streaming on the Disney Channel. But the decision was made that no, you really should name these new planets after classical figures, like the old planets were named. And so Uranus was named after a god of the sky from Greek mythology. He also happened to be the father of Saturn, much as Saturn in mythology was the father of Jupiter. So it made sense to use the term Uranus for this planet. And so that was it, seven, basically doubling the size of the known solar system on that one night in March of 1781. Until then, the most distant planet was Saturn at a billion miles away, Uranus twice as far at two billion miles from the sun. So we've only sent one robot ever to this planet, and uh, it showed us wonders that allowed us to really understand this planet in much greater detail than we'd ever had before. The, and that was called Voyager 2. So April, uh, excuse me, not April, August 1977, the uh, days of disco, as many of us were discoing our hearts out, this mission left Earth, Voyager 2, perhaps the single greatest NASA mission of all time in terms of robots to the solar system, went to Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And it took almost 10 years to get to Uranus. It uh, got there in January of 1986. Again, 2 billion miles away. But it showed us Neptune for the first time as a detailed close-up world. So we're following in the wake of that mission to observe the planet Uranus close up. This flyby, by the way, was overshadowed because a week before this flyby in January of 86, a Challenger tragedy happened. But the information gleaned from this flyby has completely revolutionized our understanding of Neptune. So here is Neptune. Uh, it, like all the outer planets, is a big ball of gas. Like all of the outer planets, has a ring system and has a large family of moons, 27 known moons around the planet Uranus of which five are quite substantial in size. And actually, all the moons are named after characters mainly from Shakespeare. Uh, three of them are named from poetry, characters in poetry by Alexander Pope. Here we have Miranda, for example, who is one of the main characters in The Tempest, that late great play by Shakespeare. And uh, all the other ones, the, now the first moons discovered were named not by Herschel himself, but by his son, John Herschel, and uh, the tradition now continues. So we'll get back to that in a moment. Here we have the Earth to scale with Uranus. 
You can see that it's much larger than Earth, although smaller than Jupiter and Saturn. And a thing happened to Uranus that uh, changed its nature forever when billions of years ago, a major piece of space debris knocked Uranus over on its side. So instead of being upright, it goes around the sun at a 98 degree tilt, which makes for some very interesting seasonal patterns there on Uranus. This planet also has a ring system, 14 known rings made mainly of large, dark chunks of matter, sort of in, in yards and yards in diameter. The rings were discovered from Earth in 1977 and confirmed by the flyby uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, 86. So lying on its side, going around the sun, very interesting patterns there in the planet Uranus. So actually, getting back to the moons for a moment, uh, John Herschel, the son of William, wanted to name the moons of Uranus after creatures of the air, fairies as it were, because Uranus was the god of the sky. And so the first ones are called Titania and Oberyn from Shakespeare. But that got the tradition going of naming all of these moons after characters from Shakespeare, or a few again from Alexander Pope. So here is Miranda, the smallest of the five big moons, discovered only in 1946 by the great astronomer Gerard Kuiper. And it's a wonderland. So something hit Miranda long ago that nearly destroyed it and left this jumbled landscape behind. The fascinating world of Uranus, the largest uh, cliffs in the solar system are also found here at Miranda, uh, 12 miles or so high. So there are many, many, many wonders. So someone is asking, what's the diameter of Uranus? It's about 30,000 miles in diameter. That is roughly two and a half times as smaller than, than Jupiter, but much, much bigger than our uh, little rocky worlds like the Earth and Venus. Do a quick check here. Uh, so th that is, uh, let me check that for now. Okay, so let's, that is wrapping up the section on Uranus. So right away, upon discovering the planet Uranus, it was clear within two years that Uranus was not quite behaving in its orbit like it should. It was never quite where the astronomers predicted where it would be. So they realized there had to be another large planet beyond Uranus tugging on it. And a number of astronomers did the math to try to figure out both how big the planet should be and where it should be in the sky. And a key person who led that charge is Urbain Le Verrier, French mathematician, who did the mathematics and actually predicted in 1946, 1846, 1846, exactly where this new planet should be in the sky. The problem was it was summertime in France and there were no observatories available to look for it. So he wrote a letter to the Berlin Observatory, which you see here, I believe it's still there in Berlin. And the letter arrived and, uh, and uh, a, an astronomer named Johann Galle got the letter and uh, saw this prediction that if you look in a certain part of the sky between Capricorn and Aquarius, you'll find a new planet. And he was pretty excited and went to his boss, who was also named Johann, apparently a very popular name in Germany, Johann Enke, and said, Johann, can I look for this planet that this Frenchman has predicted using our telescope tonight? It was Enke's 55th birthday. Enke said, I'm going to go home to my birthday party. But if you want to stay here and look at for this planet, then go to town. And so Gale did get in the telescope that night here in the Berlin Observatory, looked where de Verrier said this planet should be, and within one hour, he found the planet Neptune. One of the great victories of science in the 19th century, predicting by mathematics where the planet would be, and then instantly, within an hour, proving the mathematics by finding what is now called the planet Neptune. Now, every story has a sad element to it as well. So another man over in England, John Couch Adams, did the same work as Le Verrier in mathematically predicting where Neptune would be. But he was never able to get anyone in England to look for it. And so John Couch Adams here had done the math but didn't close the deal by getting someone to find uh, the planet Neptune. So he's giving sort of a lower co-credit now for finding it. Astronomy then and now is an international effort. The planet was named after Neptune, the god of the sea. This is a 50 franc note from France. And although international, you can also see that they're quite proud that it was a Frenchman who predicted 
the location of Neptune and the fact that this says 1846 here makes it clear that this is a reference to the discovery of the planet Neptune that year named for Neptune, the god of the sea. So one of the great moments in astronomy in the 19th century, a great example of partnership between institutions and of using mathematics and reinforcing it with actual observation. So Neptune is in the sky tomorrow morning. So if you're an early riser, if you look right above the moon and have a good sized telescope, Neptune is right above the moon tomorrow morning, uh, just before dawn on July 10. Now we've also only sent one spacecraft to Neptune, and in fact, it was the same spacecraft that went to Uranus. It's the Voyager 2 on the Grand Tour. So three years after encountering Uranus in 86, it got to Neptune in 1989. So Uranus and Neptune are as close to being twins as any planets can be. They're both about 30,000 miles in diameter, giant balls of gas with some ice mixed in. They both have rings and large families of moons around them. But even twins have differences, so Neptune is not tilted the way Uranus is. And there's more features in the cloud tops of Neptune than we saw on the very bland surface of Uranus. Neptune's rings are composed of finer material than the big boulders that make up the rings around the planet Uranus. We just saw that there's more sort of markings in the clouds at Neptune, more streams and a big dark spot even. Now here is Triton, named for one of the minor deities of the sea. So the moons of Neptune are actually named after minor sea deities. You might think of them as submariners, perhaps. And so Triton is a fascinating moon, a very large moon, that also has much in common with Pluto and may in fact be a captured member of the Kuiper belt, that belt that contains Pluto and many other objects. It has a very icy nitrogen surface, and as we'll see in a moment, even has live geology going on. Here we can see more features there in the clouds of Neptune than we saw in Uranus. Yeah, so Neptune around 30,000 miles in diameter, much like the planet Uranus, three billion miles from the sun, and the winds are ferocious here in the cloud tops, about uh, 900 miles an hour the winds zipping through the upper decks. So here we have a close-up view of Triton. So Triton is geologically active, and in fact, these are geysers of nitrogen gas mixed together with dirt and dust from the insides of the moons. So there are not many moons that have active geology, but one of them is Triton. And actually, it has an incredibly thin atmosphere that has enough wind to take these geysers as they're erupting and bend them 90 degrees. So a fascinating world. Just as a point of clarification, I should mention this is Triton, T-R-I-T-O-N. Do not confuse it with Titan, the giant moon with a very thick atmosphere that orbits the planet Saturn. So we're discovering fascinating icy wonderlands here in the deep solar system. Triton also, the only major moon that orbits retrograde or in the wrong direction as the planet turns. It must be a captured object, in other words. So there we are. Here we are in the morning sky again, and also in the morning sky, if that weren't enough, again, the morning sky tomorrow, we have the planet Pluto. And I mean, it's going to be really hard to see Pluto, but it is actually quite close to the bright dot of Jupiter. And the planet Pluto was uh, another uh, object that required a long quest that led to its discovery long before, long after its existence was theorized. So there was some wonderings after they found Neptune that could there be a ninth planet beyond Neptune. And among the folks who carried on the quest was one of the last of the great amateur astronomers, a tradition going back at least to, to Herschel. So Percival Lowell built the Lowell Observatory in the early 20th century, primarily to observe the planet Mars. So here's a plug. So if you wanted to catch our show next week, 1 o'clock on next Thursday, the 16th of July, Lowell's going to figure it, have a bigger role in that show because his main passion was trying to find the canals on Mars. That was one of his great... He built this observatory for Mars hunting primarily, but also at the end of his life, the last decade or so in the early 20th century, he became very taken with using his 
really cool observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona to find the ninth planet in the solar system. From a very rich Boston family, Lowell, Massachusetts, I know we have some folks online who are from Lowell. Indeed, I am from Massachusetts, and yes, indeedy, in fact, uh, he's from that same well-placed Boston family and was able to use his family finances to build this observatory. So I want to mention, uh, if anyone wants to donate to us, there's a donate button there. We are doing these programs to really try to keep astronomy alive and kicking and to carry on uh, a love for the cosmos and for the great tradition of astronomy, which has got some really interesting stories, as you may be noticing. We'll hear more about Mr. Lowell of, of Boston, Massachusetts in our next show. So Lowell died in 1916 without finding Planet X. And his observatory kind of fell on quiet days after he passed away. So the 1920s were an amazing time for big astronomy, like realizing that we were living in a universe full of galaxies. That was a discovery made in 1925. But planetary studies really dropped off in the 1920s, in part probably because Lowell being a great advocate of canals on Mars, which didn't exist, made astronomers maybe think that amateurs were, and, and planetary studies were a source of, of, of false information. But in 1929, at the end of that kind of dry period for planetary astronomy, this gentleman, uh, Clyde Tumbaugh from Kansas, was hired to work at the Lowell Observatory and to carry on the work of trying to find the missing Planet Nine that had so obsessed Percival Lowell. So Tumbaugh used the telescopes there. But so here's the thing about, I suppose, any branch of science. When you have a tool like a telescope, you squeeze as much information as you possibly can out of it. But sooner or later, you hit a dead end, and you either have to find new technology or you have to combine different pieces of existing technology to carry yourself forward in terms of learning more about the universe. So Lowell and Kumba following him used a camera to observe the nighttime sky. And they would take an image of the same part of the sky one week apart. And what Tumba did would be to, he would compare the exact same part of the sky side by side and try to find a moving dot. Now a third piece besides the camera and the telescope that was a great help was a device that would flash back and forth between the two pictures of the sky, allowing an astronomer to very quickly find out which of the dots is moving against the starry background. It's the same idea. If a thing is moving against the starry background, it's got to be part of our solar system, whether it's a planet or a comet or an asteroid. And so here's the Blink comparator, the one actually used to find Pluto. Take a moment, pretend you're Clyde Tumbaugh, and try to find the single dot in this view of the sky of that's moving from the constellation of Gemini. Imagine how hard it was for night after night, day after day, for Tumba to observe one plate after another, trying to find the single dot that was moving against the starry background. It took a lot of patience. We're now highlighting it. There it is. This is the discovery of Pluto on the 18th of February, 1930. Tumba realized that they had discovered what was then called the ninth planet in the solar system. So a major discovery, and they took about three and a half weeks to announce to the world that they had discovered a new planet, in part because the Lowell Observatory and Lowell himself had really pushed the idea that Mars had canals. Indeed, Lowell thought he saw canals on Venus. So the astronomy community was rather wary of information coming out of the Lowell Observatory. But after giving it three weeks, checking their data, making absolutely sure they had found it, they announced to the world on March 13, 1930, that Pluto, the ninth planet, had been found. Now, it wasn't quite called Pluto yet. They, again, it was still kind of a new business, how you name planets that you're discovering. So the suggestion for calling it Pluto came from a young woman, 11 years old, uh, and she was named Vernita Burnley. And she suggested naming the planet after the god of the dead in Roman mythology. The realm of Hades, where Pluto lives, a cold, dark, isolated, seemed like a really good name to apply to this very distant planet that had just been discovered. 
So I know the thing you're really wondering, which came first, the dog or the planet named Pluto? And the answer is both. So 1929, Disney had an animated dog character that was unnamed. March of 1930, Tumbaugh announces they found this new planet, and the name Pluto was then assigned later in 1930 to the dog that is now called Pluto. So definitely was named, though, after the planet and catching the excitement of discovering this distant planet. So a pretty big deal, 1930, major discovery, only planet discovered from North America. So we'll be talking more later in our show in a few minutes about the reclassification of Pluto. But when Tumbaugh discovered Pluto, he thought it was far more massive than our own planet Earth, maybe up to 10 times as massive. And part of the history of Pluto since then has been realizing as time goes on that it's far smaller than we thought it was. So in fact, by the 1950s, they thought it was roughly the same size as the planet Mars, which is a pretty small planet at 4,000 miles in diameter. And then in the 1970s, they realized that in looking at Pluto, the dot of light coming from Pluto was combining not only Pluto, but a large moon of Pluto, it's now called Charon. And so they realized that that dot of light they were seeing was the combined light of Pluto and its large moon. And it was actually Jim Christie, an astronomer with the US Naval Observatory, who took pictures of Pluto, amplified them, noticed a bump on the side of Pluto, and realized from that that there was a moon very, very close to Pluto. And when, you, when they realized that, that even further shrank the size of Pluto to at this point now, Pluto is known to be smaller than our own moon. Pluto, in fact, is 1,500 miles in diameter which is roughly the diameter of Alaska from top to bottom. Really big for a state, kind of small for a planet. So that was one of the threads that was evolving that led to the decision of the International Astronomical Union to reclassify Pluto as a dwarf planet. Now that occurred in 2006 in the summer, the International Astronomical Union, the only authority that can name objects in the heavens, made that call. But big year for Pluto, 2006, is also the year that the New Horizons mission, the only mission to ever go to Pluto, was launched on its nine and a half year trip to the planet Pluto. And because of New Horizons, we were able to see Pluto really in detail for the first time. There's a lot of concern that Pluto might be as dead as our own moon when they saw it close up. And the delightful thing was that Pluto is a very lively planet. So the encounter of New Horizons going past Pluto happened only as, as recently as July 14, 2015. So the fifth anniversary of this encounter is coming up this coming Tuesday, which of course is also the French national holiday, Bastille Day. As we'll hear over and over, astronomy waits for no national holidays. The encounter happened on the 14th of July, 2015, and showed us immediately that Pluto is a lively and interesting world. This great plane here is called the region of Tumba, named for the discoverer of Pluto. It's a great sheet of uh, primarily nitrogen ice. Pluto itself is made primarily on its surface. The surface is mainly water ice, but it's covered over with different flavors of ice like methane and nitrogen uh, and dry ice. There are no craters on this side. The craters have been covered over by recent activity here on this uh, great plain of Pluto. And there may well be, below the surface, an underground ocean. Pluto may be one of the bodies in the solar system that has a liquid water ocean underneath. So who knows? Could there be some strange Plutonian fish swimming there? Could be. Wherever we find water on Earth, we find life. Now, Pluto also, in terms of just how interesting it is, has this very shiny side with this nitrogen ice plane, and then a darker side of much older terrain that is heavily cratered from bombardments from billions of years ago. There's also kind of a reddish junk on Pluto uh, called tholins, this kind of gunky organic material that gives Pluto also the other nickname that it has of being the second red planet. Now, because it's organic material doesn't mean that there's life on Pluto. It just means that these are materials that life needs to survive. So there we have uh, 
a view of Pluto, a fascinating world, a lively world, and uh, one that we thank heavens have seen thanks to this single mission that has gone by this realm. So Pluto, 1,500 miles in diameter, again, about the size of, of uh, Alaska. Its moon is actually the size of Texas. When I say its moon, I mean the one big one, the one named Charon. So here is Charon. So one question we get is, how do you say the word C-H-A-R-O-N? So the connect, 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 the correct pronunciation would be Charon. But Jim Christie, who discovered it, his wife's was named Charlene. And so he partly found a way to name it after a classical figure. Charon is a figure who ferries souls across the river Styx in the underworld, while also paying homage to his wife. So that's why we tend to use the term Charon in honor of Jim Christie's wife Charlene, as opposed to Charon, as you'd hear in, in classical Latin. So big world. 750 miles across, so as big as Texas compared to the Alaska size of Pluto. Great craters and cracks upon its surface and a very intriguing world in its own. So this moon is only 12,000 miles away from Pluto. So I am about as close to Australia as I sit here in New Jersey as Sharon is to Pluto. And in fact, some of that kind of red gunky material called Tholins, this reddish stuff has blown over essentially from the planet Pluto to the surface of Charon. There's also four other moons around Pluto, much, 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 much smaller. So the only large one here is this moon Charon, which again is so close to Pluto that it wasn't until 1978 we came to even realize there was a large moon orbiting that planet. All right, so we began to plant the seed for discussing why Pluto is now called a dwarf planet a moment ago by talking about how it's now way smaller than we thought it was back when Tumba discovered it. So that was one thread leading to this uh, classification. But the other one is the discovery of several objects in the deep solar system that were roughly the same size as Pluto itself. And so quite appropriately, as many have pointed out, this is, in fact, a now-called dwarf planet named Eris, spelled E-R-I-S, named after the Greek goddess of discord. And it did kind of open the door on the process that led to Pluto being reclassified. So this is an object that is about the same size and it is more massive than the planet Pluto. And it's way beyond Pluto. It's in the deep, deep solar system. And here is actually the recording that recorded the existence of Eris. So again, the same approach, looking for a dot that is moving against the starry background, now using a computer and a recorder called a charge coupling device. A team working out of Caltech, Dr. Brown being in charge of it, Mike Brown, found evidence of several dwarf planets in the deep solar system. So Pluto is there, so uh, the series. We're going to talk about why it's in this list in just a moment. Well beyond Pluto, in 2005, they announced they had discovered Eris, but also they found two other objects in the same basic size, named Haumea, named for a Hawaiian goddess of childbirth, and Make Make, named for a Easter Island goddess of fertility. And all of these were in the same ballpark in terms of being roughly the same size as the planet Pluto. And we realize now, in addition to all of this, these all belong to a much more substantial belt of material called the Kuiper Belt, K-U-I-P-E-R, of which these are the largest known objects. So with the Kuiper Belt being there and all that jazz, it could well have come to the point where we would turn out to have 100 objects in the rough size range as Pluto, unless there was some other way to reclassify what a planet was. And so that was the thinking about whether or not Pluto should still be a planet. So when the International Astronomical Union met in Prague in the summer of 2006, they did come up with a reclassification of what it now takes to be a planet. To be a planet, you have to be round, which Pluto is. You have to orbit the sun by yourself. You can't be a moon. So Pluto does orbit the sun by itself. But you now have to be massive enough 
to clear out your own orbit. So all the junk and debris in your own orbit, you have to clear that out as you're going around the sun. And based on that third qualification, Pluto was reclassified from being a planet to being a dwarf planet. Although if it's any consolation, it's the king of the dwarfs. It's the largest by a few miles of the dwarf planets. It's a few miles larger than, the, uh, than Eris. So here is Eris in the deep, deep solar system, Pluto. Also in the dwarf planet category, we have Haumea, a little smaller as you can see, and Makemake. And also Ceres in the asteroid belt got itself a promotion. It's large enough at 580 miles in diameter and massive enough to qualify as a dwarf planet. So here are the now currently known five dwarfs of the deep solar system, Eris, Pluto, Haumea, Makemake, and Ceres, all part, uh, except for the middle ones, Pluto, Haumea, Makemake, primarily in the Kuiper belt, Ceres in the asteroid belt, and Eris going way, way beyond the uh, Kuiper belt to uh, the deep solar system. So that is the status now. You may have heard rumors about how the IAU changed their minds two years ago and decided to re-reclassify Pluto as a planet. That was, in fact, a April Fool's joke. So at this point, Pluto is still considered a dwarf planet. There are some astronomers who don't agree with that reclass, including Dr. Stern, who led the New Horizons mission. But at this point, the IAU, which is the only organization that has the right to name the planets, does consider Pluto, Pluto a dwarf planet. And hey, in some ways, it's cool because it is now the largest of the dwarfs instead of being by far, by far the smallest of the nine sort of classical planets. So this certainly is uh, a hot topic of debate. I get more questions about the status of Pluto than any other thing that I get questions about. And uh, it's a really interesting uh, evolution and really uh, wound up in the popular culture. You had Stephen Colbert, for example, talking about the reclass and all that. And the term to Pluto somethings means to reduce something in status. That actually became a popular culture term recently. Well, anyway, whatever you call it, it's still a fascinating world and was explored by New Horizons in detail five years ago. New Horizons was not done. New Horizons moved on, and three and a half years after it went past Pluto here, it went to a more typical, much smaller example of a Kuiper Belt object called Ultima Thule. Ultima Thule is a term on ancient map, maps, meaning land beyond the known land. On the first day of 2019, July 1, again, astronomy waits for no holiday, it encountered this little piece of rock, the most primitive object we've ever seen with a space mission, about 20 miles long, about the size of Manhattan, is a very typical example of the icy, rocky debris that makes up the Kuiper belt to which Pluto and Haumea and Makemake belong to. So that was an encounter that happened on the first day of 2009, and New Horizons continues now plunging into the deep, deep solar system. So here's an example of how things look right now in terms of our understanding of the solar system. So it may be even hard to see because our solar system's knowledge is so broad now, but tucked in here we have the sun and all the inner planets are here. This first white band is the asteroid zone that lies in between Mars and Jupiter. We're labeling Ceres there the one dwarf planet that is in the inner solar system. I see a question here asking about uh, what makes a dwarf planet. To be a dwarf planet, you still have to orbit the sun by yourself and you have to be at least an object that gets into some kind of a round form. You can be kind of oval shaped, but you have to have enough uh, material in it to kind of round it out and not be a lumpy potato, for example, like most of the asteroids are. I apologize to any asteroids that may be listening to this show. Uh, beyond that, we have Jupiter, Saturn, uh, Uranus, Neptune, and then the Kuiper belt, the, well, the realm of kind of icy material that also is uh, the realm that Pluto is the largest uh, element, object in, in, in that zone. And actually the Kuiper Belt, named for Gerard Kuiper, who was an absolutely crucial astronomer in introducing infrared technology to astronomy. He didn't actually predict the existence of this belt, but he did much of the research that led to realizing uh, that there was this belt way beyond the asteroid belt. We didn't really confirm or discover anything 
in the Kuiper Belt, or that even existed until the year 1992. So this is fairly recent information. But this is actually not the end. We do think, in fact, that the Kuiper, Kuiper Belt is a place where some comets come from. But the Kuiper Belt, although far away, is only six light hours away from the sun. So the sunlight takes about six hours to go from there to the Kuiper Belt, where Pluto and Haumea and Makemake are. But there is actually another zone way, way beyond all of that, so far away that it takes light not six hours, but six months to reach this final destination in the solar system, the giant cloud of comet material called the Oort cloud that lies about one-eighth of the way to the nearest star. So here's our current inner-ish solar system, but we're going to now pull out and look at the final zone. Beyond the asteroid zone, beyond the Kuiper belt, we have the Oort cloud, we think. Now, unlike the Kuiper belt, which we know exists because we can see objects in it, we have not found actual proof yet that the Oort cloud exists. It was predicted in 1950 by astronomer Jan Oort. We're pretty sure it's there, and we're pretty sure that it contains these dark, icy, rocky pieces of material that occasionally get knocked in towards the sun and turn into comets. So again, out here this far away, you are approximately one-eighth of the way to the nearest star, and occasionally a passing star can knock one of these dirty snowballs five, ten miles in diameter in towards the inner solar system. And these are essentially, you can think of these as ugly ducklings in the deep solar system, but comet material then lights up and becomes a beautiful swan as it gets to the inner solar system as it crosses, say, the orbit of Mars. So as it gets closer to the light of the sun, the head of the comet, the dirty snowball, as it were, lights up. A coma forms around the head of it, and then a tail forms as well. So we were saying before the show started, it can be pretty dicey predicting how beautiful a comet's going to be. But we do have an amazing comet in the sky right now. We'll talk about that in just a moment as the last thing here in our show. So coming in, these dirty snowballs do tend to light up and heat up, and uh, they wind up often developing these very beautiful tails as they get in towards the inner solar system. And every so often, we can get a beautiful view of them. This is actually a comet uh, passing by Mars recently. But we can see comets as well from our own sky here, and they can be among those beautiful sights that you'll ever see in the sky. And I love this in connection to this show, because you are talking about objects from the deepest part of the solar system, from the Kuiper belt, which can give us some short orbit comets, and the Oort cloud far beyond, that then come to the inner solar system, light up, and serve as emissaries from the deep solar system that we've been exploring during this show. So that is the main part of the show, but before I take questions, I just wanted to uh, show a couple of pictures related to this comet that actually is in the sky right now. And this is called uh, Comet Neowise. And it actually, Todd was saying, my colleague Todd, who I knew back in Seattle days, is saying uh, he saw it in the sky yesterday and that it was spectacular. So here is a picture from the Middle East showing the comet in the morning sky just before daybreak. And it's a uh, long exposure, so it's not going to be as vivid if you see it with the naked eye. But it is naked eye visible right now. Tomorrow morning, you may be able to see it if you have a clear sky wherever you are. And it's called Comet Neowise, one of the ones found by a NASA mission. And let me show you where in the sky to look. So 4.30 or so, just before the first light of dawn. If you look uh, directly towards the northeast, and if you don't know where northeast is, well, all you got to do is take out your cell phone, and it'll show you where the directions are. Look towards the northeast. And then one fist above the northeast horizon is where you'll find the comet in the sky tomorrow and the day after. By the way, for reference, if you know the constellations, here's the large, bright constellation of Auriga the Charioteer, right above where the comet will be. So you'll have the very bright star Capella, and the line between that and the horizon where northeast is located is where the comet will be. So check that out tomorrow and the next day. It will be working its way around to the evening sky as we get later in the month. It'll be in the north below the Big Dipper. So exciting times. I don't advertise comets until we get word. You can actually see them, but this comet uh, seems to be really bright and definitely worth trying to check out in the morning sky. 
So with that, let's go ahead and see if there's any questions I can address here in the chat. So if someone was asking for a clarification, uh, so Ceres is in the inner asteroid belt. It's the only member of the asteroid belt, which is between Mars and Jupiter, that is part of, our, of the asteroid belt. And these other dwarf planets are all in the Kuiper belt or even beyond the Kuiper belt. So yeah, so it's Ceres is the only one that's, that's in. Someone said that this show is out of the world, thank you. Oh, here's a question from Victoria. Are comets considered shooting stars? Great question. Yes. So comets that come in towards the sun leave a trail of debris behind them. And during the year, the Earth wanders into this comet debris. And the little leftover bits of comet hit our atmosphere going very fast and burn up and create shooting stars. So we do actually owe our shooting stars to comets. But the appearance is very different. <clears throat> shooting star is just a little blip across the sky that just zips across the sky, blinking you'll miss it. Comets, even though we use the term comet to refer to something that moves fast, comets hang in the sky. They don't move as you look at them like a shooting star does. But the vast majority of comets, yes, indeedy, are caused by little bits of comet debris that we strike, and as they burn up, they cause shooting stars. The great uh, shooting star shower every year happens uh, uh, in the middle of August, the Perseid shower. Great question there. Anna is wondering how close can you get to the sun? Well, you need a spacecraft regardless of how you're going to the sun. So as long as the spacecraft keeps you cool, you can get quite close. But if not, uh, you're going to get really hot really fast. So a planet near the sun like Mercury Daytime high is 750 Fahrenheit on Mercury, which is uh, very, very close to the sun. So you don't want to get too close to the sun or you'll get very, very, very warm. You know, someone, uh, Stephanie is asking for a good uh, first telescope. I recommend Orion telescopes. They've got a great desktop telescope for $100. If you go to the Orion catalog, their desktop telescopes are a really good way to start being a stargazer. We actually use them at work as well. They're all, when we have star parties at work, they're very easy to use, and yet they, they amplify things very well. Jupiter and Saturn are both really well placed in the sky this entire summer. So it's a really good summer if you've had a hankering for getting a telescope. Uh, the best things you can see in the telescope are the moon, Saturn, and Jupiter, and they're all gonna be with us this summer. So yeah, so check out that comet. Look towards the northeastern sky tomorrow at uh, about 4.15 or so in the morning. Uh, can comets reach the sun? Yes, comets often do wind up hitting the sun. We've actually seen examples of that with NASA sun observing missions. They've actually recorded comets hitting the sun. Also, back in 1994, we observed a comet striking the planet Jupiter. The comet Shoemaker-Levy struck Jupiter and left black dots across Jupiter. That was actually one of the key issues that began the idea that maybe asteroids and comets could po pose a risk to us here on Earth as well and help to lead to thinking about uh, whether an asteroid or a comet could do damage striking the Earth. We actually have a whole show uh, on our LSC in the House page called Asteroid Impact if you want to hear more about the concern about impacts of these objects striking the Earth. And all of our shows, including this one, are archived on LSC in the House. In the house. So all of these are available if you want to check them out afterwards and direct your friends to it. Kathleen is wondering, how is an asteroid different from a comet? So it's getting fuzzier as we learn more about each object. But asteroids generally are rocky without much ice in them and are generally found in the zone between Jupiter and Mars from there on into the sun. So they tend to be in the inner solar system. Comets are further out generally and have far more ice in their mixture and are more loosely packed, a mix of ice and dirt. And so also comets, unlike because they have so much ice in them, put on these beautiful shows when they light up due to the heat and light coming from the sun. The, uh, how are moons made? Rena's wondering. So moons generally form. So first of all, the sun formed about 
over four billion years ago. And then planets formed out of the stuff left over that wasn't pulled into the sun. And then as the planets formed, they wound up, the matter that didn't pull, get pulled into the planets got turned into moons. So the sun forms, what's left over from that becomes planets. Planets form, what's left over from when planets form turns into moons is generally how they come together. Now, not always. For example, we're almost 100% sure now that Earth formed with no moon and then was hit by a major piece of space de debris that almost destroyed Earth and the matter knocked out from that impact long ago turned into the moon. We know that in part because astronauts bringing back rock samples from the moon, it showed that they're very similar in their makeup to rocks from planet Earth. We're going to take a couple more questions before we wrap it up. When a comet hits the sun, uh, Pooja's wondering what happens when a comet hits the sun. Not a big deal. The sun is so big, it's like, uh, I don't know, a mosquito stinging one of us, right? No impact. When it hits Jupiter, we could see dramatic disruptions in Jupiter when a comet, Shoemaker-Levy, did strike Ju Jupiter back in 1994. So yes, yeah, someone is asking how we're doing this. Uh, Zach, thanks for responding. Yeah, Digistar 6 is the software. It's a software that we use for our planetarium primarily. There is a, an open source software called Stellarium, which any of you can uh, download, which would allow you to essentially have a a planetarium on your home screens, and that's also very useful. That last shot that I showed about the location of where the comet is was made in Stellarium instead of using Digistar. So a, a repeat, Orion, O-R-I-O-N, the same name as the constellation, Orion telescopes, their telescopes that are in a hundred dollar range are really good beginner's telescopes. I highly recommend them. They're durable, it, and uh, they're great for all ages. And so I would highly recommend, if you're going to get a telescope, go for it this summer because it's going to be a great summer with the rings of Saturn, the big moons around Jupiter. And as always, whenever the moon's in the sky, the moon looks great in even a small telescope. Jessica's wondering how many solar systems there are. We don't know, Jessica, but there are thousands. And so we didn't know until the mid-90s if there were even planets around nearby stars. We've now discovered 4,000 planets around other stars, and many of them belong to whole systems. So planetary systems we know now appear to be a very common byproduct. There's probably as many planets in the universe as there are stars, which means, of course, that finding life just got easier. One of our shows in August will be on the search for alien life because you probably can't have life on a blazing star. You have to have planets to have life we know now that solar systems and planets are plentiful. Anna Chu's wondering, is the ninth planet real? So putting aside Pluto, there are some astronomers who think there is a ninth planet far beyond the known planets. And that planet is still being searched for, but there's no clear evidence yet that the new planet nine exists. But the search does continue. Yeah, so Planet X, uh, Chital is asking about that. Another name for the mysterious planet that lies beyond, maybe lies beyond the realm of Pluto. Checking over here. Okay, so Melanie's wondering about Sedna. So Sedna is another object that is a remote object beyond the orbit of Pluto. It's smaller. That it's too small to be a dwarf planet. It's not roundish like a dwarf planet is. But Sedna is also very interesting in that it may be actually the most inbound example of something from the Oort cloud. If we can learn more about Sedna, we might be able to learn more about that very, very distant Oort cloud. So it is now uh, time to do one more. Just checking over here. Yes, 4,000 planets and counting is how many planets beyond our own planet that we have found. We're probably sure there's tons. So if someone's asking about zodiac signs, so we're going to be doing a show on astrology and astronomy, and we'll talk about the zodiac signs and that. The zodiac are the 12 constellations that the sun moves in front of as it goes around the, 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 uh, the year. So that's a confusing thing for folks sometimes about zodiac signs. If you're a Gemini like I am, I can't go out on my birthday, May 23rd, and look up and see Gemini in the sky because that's the month where the sun is in front of the stars of Gemini. But folks long ago figured out which stars were being blocked by the sun and determined those to be the zodiac sign, the path of the sun. 
So uh, we'll be doing a whole show on that because there is a lot of really interesting uh, astronomy that drove astrology and vice versa. And so zodiac signs, the funny thing is, yeah, we'll talk about that in our astrology show that you can't actually see your constellation, your birth sign in the sky on your birthday because the sun is blocking that part of the sky. But so uh, once again, we're trying really hard to do what we can to keep our astronomy alive and kicking in these often challenging times. If you feel like you would like to support us, we do have a donate button there and we'd appreciate your support. And so join us again next week. So NASA is sending its next mission to Mars, a rover called Perseverance, which is a large rover about the size of Curiosity, which went in 2012, and even has a little helicopter called Ingenuity. And we're going to be talking about that in our next show. And uh, then stay tuned every Thursday at 1 o'clock all the way to the end of August at least. We're going to be doing these Planetarium online programs, trying to address the audiences that, in part based on your comments here in the chat, we realize are the uh, items that you find most interesting in this amazing universe in which we live. So thank you again, everybody, for joining us, and hopefully we'll see you next week. Uh, Andrew will be back in the chat for next week. Uh, I'll be covering the Mars show, and then Andrew will be doing the two shows after that. And thanks again for Anthony for joining us in uh, the chat, and also for Jeremy, who always does a great job supporting all of our online programming here. So thanks, and we shall see you in a week.